So today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of fluid mechanics. Now this history actually spans thousands of years. So we're not going to be able to cover everything in such a short video. I merely want to touch on some of the important events that have shaped and changed fluid mechanics. For the better or for the worse. If you're interested in a bit more in a bit more detailed history of fluid mechanics, I would recommend that you check the first chapter of Bernard's Elementary Fluid Mechanics, or you can read G. A. Toccati's A History and Philosophy of Fluid Mechanics. Both books are highly recommended. Now, fluid mechanics principles have been used for a long time. They have been used for irrigation and for navigation. So it's helped in the agriculture field, it's helped in naval warfare, and it's helped in just general traveling and trade. However, it was around the year 200 BC where a man by the name of Archimedes discovered the concept of buoyancy. Now this was a big step in fluid mechanics, and he ended up publishing his work on floating bodies, which seems to be the first published work in fluid mechanics that we have today. Following Archimedes' theoretical success, the Romans used fluid mechanics principles to help build their cities. One such example of the use of fluid mechanics is the Roman aqueduct. Now you can read all about it online, but it is something that I feel that every fluid mechanics lecture should touch on, because it is one of the important structures of antiquity that relies heavily on fluid mechanics. After the year 400, there were no major developments in fluid mechanics for about a thousand years. Ships were still being made, land was still being irrigated, but nothing much was done during that time. However, it was in the 1400s where a man by the name of Leonardo da Vinci, which you can recognize as that famous engineer, philosopher, and artist, gave birth to the field of hydraulic engineering. Leonardo da Vinci designed and developed the chambered canal lock, providing a huge advance for Italy. Leonardo da Vinci designed and developed the chambered canal lock. Through Leonardo da Vinci, the field of hydraulic engineering was established. Many engineers used his work and tried to build on it to improve drainage, irrigation, and navigation. Now, throughout the next 200 years after da Vinci's death, both mathematicians and engineers contributed to the development of fluid mechanics. However, there were certain situations where the mathematics would not really match what the engineering experiments would yield. This all culminated in a project by Dahlenberg, which we're not going to cover today, but we will cover in the future. What you need to know for now is that Dahlenberg's studies ended up giving us what's called the Dahlenberg Paradox. Now, because of the Dahlenberg Paradox, the fluids theory and fluids experiments could not be reconciled. So what happened was a split. Mathematicians continued to develop their theory and the field was called hydrodynamics. Whereas engineers continued to develop practical uses and practical applications of fluid mechanics and that field was called hydraulics. Throughout the next couple of centuries, hydrodynamics and hydraulics would function as essentially two separate fields. Now during the 1700s, there were several developments made in the fields of drainage and flood control. Of course, that is not to say that hydrodynamicists did not make any advancements. However, some of the empirical equations that we use even to this day in civil engineering were developed during that time. It wasn't until the 1800s where a brilliant man by the name of Navier and a brilliant man by the name of Stokes came up with the equations of motion for viscous fluid flow. Now these equations, colloquially known as the Navier-Stokes equations, serve to bridge the gap between hydrodynamics and hydraulics. Now there's a lot of interesting things that we can talk about when we, when we get to cover these equations in class. But for now, just try to re remember that name, Navier-Stokes. Now in the 1900s, several developments in the aerospace and aeronautics field were made. We also saw the rise of computational fluid dynamics. Throughout this century, the field of fluid mechanics started to become a more computationally dependent field. Now that is not to say that experiments and mathematics were all thrown away. No, on the contrary, 
both experimentalists and mathematicians also continue to develop theory of fluid mechanics. So don't see computation as replacing these experimental and theoretical methods, but rather complementing it. Now in more recent years, where our fields of study are becoming more and more interdisciplinary, we have seen the application of fluid mechanics to address issues such as climate change. We've also seen a new wave of researchers working on magnetohydrodynamics. We've seen fluids being used for biomechanics, as was the example of blood flow monitoring that I mentioned in the previous video, and we're also seeing fluid mechanics principles used to develop more sustainable cities and more sustainable systems. Now, whereas a couple of years ago fluid mechanics was something that only a civil engineer, maybe a mechanical engineer, and a mathematician would focus on, right now we have computer scientists, we have biomedical engineers, we even have some electrical engineers and urban planners using fluid mechanics principles to advance their fields. So this is a very exciting field with a very promising future. Now on the next video, we're actually gonna start getting into the nitty gritty of fluid mechanics. We're gonna start looking at dimensions, units, and how to use them. So I'll see you next time.